but I'm not a very good ice skater. So I figured the closest I would get to the NHL would be to be the team physician for the Philadelphia Flyers. So when I was in middle school, I started uh, going to doctor camps, doing research, trying to learn about how to be a, a doctor. And so I started learning about orthopedic surgery. That's what all the team physicians are for the most part. And, and it was great. It's amazing what we can do with orthopedic surgery. You know, you can like shatter your femur and that used to be crippling for life and now we can fix it. And you know, one of my friends is a, is a hand surgeon and she can do all this functional recovery in your hand. You can put your hand in a snowblower and tear it up and she'll, she'll put you back together. So then my favorite hockey player got a collapsed lung. And so I did an internship in a cardiothoracic unit in a hospital in New York. And again, it was just insane, the stuff that we can fix with your heart and with your lung. You know, your heart doesn't work, we can do these bypass surgeries, we can give you a pacemaker, do all this stuff to fix you. So I was like, medicine is awesome, this is great, I'm totally going to do this. And then my favorite hockey player got a concussion. And in complete contrast to all the other injuries, we can't do anything for that. And at the time, not only could we not help, but we didn't even think it was real. You know, people would say, oh, like you're too soft, it's all in your head, you're just making it up. You know, when we scan people with concussions, we can't even see that there's anything wrong. So we just have to go by their symptoms. And so it means that now you, people have damaged the organ that's controlling you know, their personality and their emotions and their ability to remember and their ability to think. And their, their, all of their ability to interact with the world. And not only can we not fix it, not only can we not help them, we can't even legitimize the claim that they're sick, that they're suffering. And it just was so apparent, even as a little kid, it's like, this is unacceptable that we can fix your bones, we can fix your heart, we can fix your blood vessels, we can do all this stuff, and when it comes to your brain, you're completely on your own. The fact of the matter is it's only been in the last few decades that we've started to look inside the brains of humans while they're behaving and of animals while they're behaving. So it's actually only now that we can see what brain cells are doing and how they're signaling. And we can start to see the patterns and figure out the rules behind the brain's behavior. So we can now ask for the first time, how is the brain computing? How is the brain interacting with the world? And it's great. I mean, it's just such a... It's just such an amazing privilege to be a neuroscientist right now. I mean, at any time in history, but especially now. Because basically every smart person going back thousands of years has wanted on some level to be a neuroscientist, right? So like, one was like, why do we think this way? Why, how do we know like truth and knowledge? And where is the self? And where is the soul? And where is consciousness? And why do we do the things that we do? So like Plato asked those questions. Aristotle and Hippocrates and, you know, everyone wanted to know and it's really only been in the last couple decades that we've had the ability to start peering inside the brains of humans and of animals and figure out, okay, what is happening there? How are they doing these things? That's why I became a neuroscientist and that's why I am a neuroscientist. Uh, we're just starting to understand the brain now and we're just starting to help. Thank you.